everybody. Wow, it is a packed room. Thank you very much for uh, joining me so early in the morning. My name is Daniel Jones. I am uh, the CTO of a consultancy called Engineer Better. And we're all about helping businesses deliver business value more quickly. Now, last year, I was reading a really interesting article from BBC News. And it was all about electrical motors, electrical generators, and their impact in factories of the 1800s. It was expected that these things would be loads more efficient, had loads of technical benefits over steam engines. But the productivity gains that were expected didn't happen for about 10, 20 years after the technology was available. In this picture, you can see a cotton mill from the 1880s. And running along the top of that picture, you can see these big crankshafts. And these were used to transmit the power from steam engines that were generating power for the factory. The layout of the factory was dictated by these crankshafts. In order to be able to transmit the power, we had to have long, thin factories so these crankshafts could run down the whole rooms. And that meant that the machines that were being powered, their layout, their location was dictated by the technology being used. And so the way that people were working was dictated by the use of steam power. Now, these days, we're not constrained by steam engines. Although having worked with a few enterprise databases, I wouldn't be surprised if in fact they were steam powered. But these factories were constrained by the, the technology that was being used. And these days, we're constrained instead by that industrial thinking. The businesses that were successful when software engineering first emerged as a discipline were those that were mass producing a million identical widgets as cheaply as possible. We don't need to write a million identical pieces of code. We need to be writing new and unique code every day as quickly as possible. So we're constrained by the old playbook. Today, I'm going to take you through some findings from cognitive psychology and neuroscience that explain why continuous delivery is better than this old management playbook, why it works better with the human brain and leads to better results. So you're probably familiar with something that looks a bit like this, an organization that's cut up into silos, specialist teams, all of whom are needed to deliver business value. They're all on the critical path. In situations like this, it often feels to the people in one silo like the people in other silos don't care about their problems. But why? They're all part of the same organization. They've all had the same HR induction. They've all got the same A1 poster of corporate values posted at the side of their desks. Could there be something to this? It turns out there might be. This is a functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner. It's used to measure levels of activity in different areas of the brain over time. Professor David Eagleman performed a study where people were placed into these scanners. And then they were shown different videos. The videos were either of a hand being lightly dabbed with a cotton wool bud or being painfully stabbed with a syringe. In this control group of subjects, baseline levels of activity in areas of the brain associated with feeling pain and with feeling empathy were measured. So empathy being your ability to put yourself in someone else's uh, situation. So the control group, that gave us the baseline measurements. The experiment was then repeated. This time, subjects were asked to identify their religious beliefs before they entered the scanner. Are you a Jew? Are you a Muslim? Are you an atheist? Are you a Sikh? This time, when they were showed videos, the videos also showed the religious beliefs of the person being hurt. When the observer shared the same religious identity as the person being hurt, they had a larger empathic response. When the, when the observer did not share the religious identity of the person being hurt, their empathic response was smaller. Smaller than when there had been no labels at all. This showed that people care less about outgroups. As soon as you start cutting people up into my team and your team, my tribe and your tribe, you become less able to empathize with people you consider other. So let's go back to our silos. Well, it's no wonder that these people don't care about each other's problems. For a start, they're not working together. They're in silos. 
Even if they were working together, they're not going to care about each other's issues. Like the database people are going to worry about the database problems and protect the database. Luckily, this is where continuous delivery can help us. Continuous delivery requires an amount of automation to take some of these functions off the critical path to delivering business value. That means that we end up with a smaller problem space. What do I mean by problem space? Well, if these are all the silos that we had previously, then the problem space adds up to this. This is like all of the stuff that we need to know about in order to be able to get features out of the door. But if we're going to continuously deliver, we need to take some of these things off the critical path and automate them instead. Even things like databases, you know, with a good platform, you shouldn't need to know how to stand up a database that should be automated for you. You just need to know how to consume it. So you're left with a set of problems that's a fraction the size of what it was before. That means that you don't need such broad and deep knowledge in so many specialist areas. Instead, you can focus your resources in one cross-functional product team who have a shared identity and share the same problems because they're all working on the same thing together. Turns out, if we co-locate the people in this product team, put them in the same uh, physical location, we get other benefits too. A trio of Norwegian scientists uh, performed some research looking into the correlation between productivity and human capital. So human capital being the education and experience of members of staff in these different consultancies. They also looked for a correlation between productivity and social capital. So how often people communicate, how frequently, how many people they communicate with. In all three cases, social capital correlated pro positively with productivity. In two out of three cases, human capital, the education and experience of people working in these businesses, did not correlate with productivity at all. Now, if you think of a business like a network, this makes perfect sense, right? If this is the phone network, and there are only two phones, and you can only make one phone call, it's not very valuable. It's not very productive, can't do much work. But if we have more nodes, and we have more connections between those nodes, this is a much more productive and valuable system. This is why cities are awesome, because of the opportunity for cross-pollination. Now, another way that we can improve the productivity of this network is by making those communications more reliable, making sure that the messages sent are understood first time. They don't need to be repeated. With humans, we can do that with some uncanny abilities of the human brain. Now, trying to look out over the front. When you saw that, some of you may have raised your eyebrows just a touch. Some of you may have widened your eyes just a little bit in what's called a micro-expression. And if you did, it could have been because of things called mirror neurons, which are a brain cell which shows a particular type of behavior. They're not physically different. They're a brain cell that shows a particular type of behavior. They trigger when an action is performed and also when an action is perceived. Now, in humans, they're not proven to exist, right? There aren't many volunteers for the invasive brain surgery that would be required uh, to prove their existence. But they have been demonstrated in apes. And instead, we talk about the mirror system in humans. And the mirror system gives rise to something called the mirror hypothesis. This is that. When you see somebody else's face, your mirror system fires, sending signals to your facial muscles, causing you to mimic their expression. And then through something called embodied cognition, physiological information is assimilated by the orbitofrontal cortex, and that helps tip your decision-making process. People that have this area of the brain damaged make it very, find it very hard to make gut, what we would call gut decisions. So it's, when you look at someone smiling, it's not just that you know as a semantic fact that, ah, smiling humans are happy. You put yourself in the same physiological state, so you get an innate understanding of their state of mind. And there's some really cool evidence for this. A study was performed where a control group of subjects were asked to identify the emotions being expressed in photographs. The experiment was then repeated, and instead of the control group, this time the subjects were Botox users. Now, for those of you not into your cosmetic surgery, Botox is a lethal neurotoxin, which in teeny tiny doses is just enough to paralyze facial muscles, stop you from using them to stop you getting wrinkles. On average, 
Botox users were less able to correctly identify emotions being expressed in photographs. Now, I'm not saying that Botox users are emotionally dead, narcissistic sociopaths. <laughs> Definitely not saying that. And that's not what the research said either. Okay? But it suggested that the chain was broken, that their mirror system was firing, sending the signals to the facial muscles, which then weren't responding, depriving their brains of this physiological information, this physiological input. So if we put that together, human contact leads to empathy. If we can be face to face, we can understand each other's intent more easily. Empathy is the lubricant of sociability. It's easier to get along with people and communicate with them if you understand them in the first place, if you understand where they're coming from. And sociability is po cor positively correlated with productivity. So you probably, you know, we all know that narrowband communications suck, right? And that it's hard to understand people's intent in text messages. That's why we have emojis. As the father of a nine-year-old daughter, I really wish that we didn't have emojis, um, but unfortunately we do. So every time that you send an instant message instead of picking up the phone, or you pick up the phone instead of having a video call or going to someone's desk, you're missing out on these abilities that we seem to have. So let's go back to our product team. Yay! They're all communicating face-to-face. -face. They've got a shared identity, synchronous communication. Everything's happening very quickly. But in the old world, things didn't used to look like that. Communication was asynchronous, and it was slow. That meant that there was a high cost to coordination. If you wanted to get the test team's time, maybe it would take you six weeks to get two weeks of their time. There was a high transaction cost to organizing anything. And this has negative consequences. It meant that instead of doing one thing at a time, we'd bunch aspects of features together. We'd have teams working on a whole bunch of different stuff rather than one thing at a time, because it would cost so much to, to get their time in the first place. And in the situations like this, stuff like load testing tends to appear at the end of the waterfall. And in situations like this, things like load testing near the end of the Gantt chart tend to fail. But why? We're doing waterfall. We've got an exhaustive requirements document. The business analyst spent a very long time looking into all the details. Didn't you read chapter 37 where it says that we should be able to sustain 1,000 requests a second? The reason these things fail when they tend to appear at the end of the Gantt chart could be down to something called the present bias. This is a well-observed psychological phenomenon, uh, observed since the 50s, that shows that humans value things more highly when they're close to them, both in space and in time. This is why buy now, pay later sofas are still a thing. But as I said, that's well-observed since the 50s, so it's not novel, not particularly exciting. What is new and novel is that recently, it's been suggested that there is a biological underpinning for the present bias. Some rhesus monkeys were given a choice between a little bit of sugar water now or a slightly bigger bit of sugar water in a few seconds' time. And by varying the size of the drops of sugar water and the delay, scientists were able to map the preferences of these monkeys. Like, how much more sugar water does a monkey need to make it worth waiting five seconds for? So these preferences were, were mapped out. These lucky, lucky monkeys then had uh, electrodes inserted into the intraparietal area of their brains, and the firing rates of specific neurons were observed. And these neurons seem to be encoding the value of these choices. So the faster they were popping, the more valuable the choice. The slower they were popping, the less valuable the choice. When the observed preferences of these monkeys and the firing rates of these neurons are plotted together, there's a near one-to-one -one mapping between the two of them. In this diagram, uh, in this chart, the red line is the observed behavior, and the black line is the neuronal fire, firing rates. In neuroscience, it is really unusual to see something with such a clear explanation. The brain is full of competing complex adaptive networks that are in tension with each other. Figuring stuff out is really hard. This is a really unusual finding. If the present bias has a biological underpinning, it means it's unavoidable. We can't escape it. We might be able to rationalize about it, but that requires self-control, which we'll talk about in a little while. So if we can't get away from the present bias, can we exploit it instead? Let's have a look at our Gantt chart. Well, we already talked about continuous delivery requiring automation. A load of this stuff isn't on the critical path anymore. 
It's been automated away by the teams that used to be responsible for it. In this, uh, we said we're going to have one product team. So we shouldn't be doing testing and development separately, certainly not in 2018. One would hope we're doing test-driven development. And when we've got one team, it doesn't make sense to be doing three things at once. We can work on one feature at a time. How, teams with self-service who uh, have the automation to continuously deliver can work on one thing at a time, and it becomes economical to do so. And that means that everything that's important about a feature is important now. Not in three months' time to another team that I don't know. It's important to me and my team now, today. That allows us to exploit the present bias rather than falling victim to it. Continuous delivery can also help us with technical debt in a couple of different ways. In 2013, uh, Sendil Miller-Nathan and Elder Shafir uh, started looking into the uh, psychological effects of knowing that you don't have enough of something that's important to you in your life. In an exemplary piece of research, they posed shoppers in a New Jersey mall a hypothetical question. You've been involved in a car accident. Your insurer isn't going to cover the costs of repair to your car. How are you going to get back on the road? How are you going to find the money to repair your car? Respondents were split into uh, two different categories according to their income, either rich or poor. And each uh, respondent was asked only one question, but they were asked different versions of the question. They either had to find $300 to repair their car or $3,000 to repair their car. After answering this hypothetical question, they were given a fluid intelligence test. This is Raven's progressive matrices. It's used as a proxy for IQ. For the rich people, it didn't matter whether they were asked to find $300 or $3,000. Their scores were about where you would expect them to be. For the poor people that were asked to find $300, their scores were about where you would expect them to be, controlling for demographics. But for the poor people who were asked to find $3,000, their effective IQ dropped by 13 to 14 points compared to what you would expect. Fascinated by this, the researchers went on to look for other effects of scarcity. One of their tools of choice was the Stroop test. You've probably seen things like this, where you have to say the word that's printed rather than the color it's printed in. That exercises uh, executive control, self-control, because you have to inhibit responses from different areas of the brain. Time and time again, the researchers found that scarcity reduces people's self-control and their ability to remember to do stuff in the future. It's not just caused by a scarcity of money, though. It can be caused by a scarcity of other more abstract things, like social contact. Being lonely uh, causes the scarcity effect. But importantly for us in software engineering, the scarcity effect can also be triggered by time. Now, you have a think about what's going on in the brains of your engineers every time you remind them there's a deadline looming. Every time that the Scrum Master walks up and goes, oh, well, end of the sprint on Friday. Is that going to fall into this sprint or next sprint? We don't want to have to replan it. We don't want to fail our commitments. Every time you do that, you are reducing people's ability to solve abstract problems, which, last time I checked, is what we hired software engineers to do. But worse than that, you're also reducing their self-control. So they're more likely to incur technical debt to meet your deadline. But to top it all off, you're also making them less able to remember to do stuff in the future. So they're less able to remember to patch the corners they cut to meet your deadline. Now, if you're doing waterfall, you know, ah, maybe this happens once every three months. Maybe the hit isn't that big. If you're practicing Scrum and you're fretting over the commitments you've made and whether things fall into this sprint or next, you're doing this every two weeks. Your teams will be in a state of constant, perpetual scarcity. And why? why? Why do we do this? Because we need to make commitments. Because the business doesn't trust us. Yes, boss, we will get the work done, boss. We've committed to it, boss. We're not going to goof off. You can trust us. Luckily, there's a better way. Continuous delivery can make deadlines meaningless. You want to know how fast one of my teams goes? You go look in production. You go and see the features that have been delivered. 
You see the features in the hands of users. You look at the revenue that's been generated. You look at the data that's been generated. Don't ask me to guess what might happen in two weeks' time. I'm not a clairvoyant. If I could see into the future, I'd be buying lottery tickets, not practicing Scrum. But we can combine this with two really simple ideas to make continuous delivery transcend the scarcity effect. We should always be continuously delivering the most important thing. If we're always working on the business's number one priority, then we're not goofing off. Let's go back to our project plan. Well, eh, no one's going to win any Prince 2 awards for a Gantt chart like that, are they? One bar in Microsoft Project. But through the power of keynote rotation, we turn it around 90 degrees, we get something that looks an awful lot like an ordered backlog. A single list of work, a single backlog of work prioritized by the business. Engineers promise to only ever take the task at the top. Not the task they want, not the one they think they're going to be good at. The one that's at the top. And with this promise, the business can trust us that we're always working on their top priority. Now, if we were always deliver the most important thing in the simplest way, then we're taking the shortest route to the number one priority. We've trimmed all the fat off the task. We're not over-engineering anything. If you come to us with a requirement to cut things, we're not going to build you this. We're going to build you something like that. Delivering the most important thing in the simplest way means we're taking the shortest route to the top priority. At which point, sticking a date on a calendar becomes completely meaningless. It's a little bit like shouting at the Earth, trying to make it go around the sun faster. Like, it's got kinetic energy. It's got mass. Do we have any physicists in the room? Yeah, do, do deadlines feature in the equations for uh, velocity? No, no, they don't. Thank you. Um, yeah, you, oh, you can reduce the amount of mass. You can make the task simpler. You can add kinetic energy. You can add more resource to your team up to a point. Dates are complete, they, they don't factor into it. The work will get done when the work gets done. That's an inescapable fact. Continuous delivery can help us with technical debt in another way too. You've probably heard of uh, studies that were performed in US jails looking at the outcomes of parole board hearings. In one, it was found that if you had your parole hearing at the end of the day, you stood a 20% chance of success. But if you had your hearing just after lunch, you stood a 65% chance of being granted parole. And for a long time, people thought that this had something to do with the fact that the parole board had just had lunch um, and that they'd eaten, they'd uh, ingested some food, digested some glucose, metabolized it into lysine, which is used in the premedial frontal cortex, which is the area of the brain responsible for executive control, so self-control that we mentioned earlier. But in a finding that has been repeated a couple of times uh, this decade, it seems that there's more to it than that. Subjects are given an exhaustive Stroop test. So they start doing these things until they re repeatedly fail. They were then immediately given a drink to gargle, either a sugary drink or an artificially sweetened drink. They're gargling it, <laughs> spitting it out. And then straight away, you have to squeeze a hand grip exerciser for as long and as hard as they can to demonstrate their willpower. So who did better? Sugary drink? artificially sweetened drink. Turns out the people that had the sugary drink could demonstrate more self-control afterwards, more willpower afterwards. But why? Right? They're, they're gargling it. They're not even swallowing it. And even if they cheated and swallowed some of the drink, there's no way they could have digested it and metabolized it in time to make a difference. Instead, the conclusion was that glucose was binding to chemical receptors on the tongue that are activating the reward networks in the brain. And it's this sense of reward that replenishes people's willpower. Now, anecdotally, that makes perfect sense, right? You think about the, the bad days that become ever worse. When you're not feeling rewarded and you're having a bad day, it's harder to resist temptation. When you're having a good day, you feel rewarded, it's easier to resist temptation. It becomes a, a positive feedback loop. So let's think about our software engineers working through our ordered backlog. Well, instead of getting a sense of reward once every three months when they're working on something completely different. Uh, by the way, Rachel, our, our like, stuff went live. Uh, what, what stuff was that? When did we work on that? You know, it, 
Instead, with continuous delivery, we're seeing features go out the door every day. We're getting a constant trickle of rewards. Tests going green, features in the hands of users. This is going to improve our engineers' self-control, helping them to resist the urge or resist temptation of accruing technical debt. Continuous delivery forces us to automate. That allows us a smaller problem space. We don't need such broad and deep knowledge in so many different areas. We can focus our resources into a product team that's cross-functional with a shared identity, so they all care about the same problems. If we co-locate them, then we can get extra benefits too. We can make them more sociable, which should lead to better productivity. If we're continuously delivering that same automation, makes feature-based workflows economical. A team that is self-sufficient doesn't have to coordinate with others. It can get on and do things quickly, and that means that it's economical to work on one feature at a time. Working on one feature at a time <coughs> means that everything that's important about that feature is important now, allowing us to exploit the present bias rather than falling victim to it. Continuously delivering the most important thing in the simplest way makes deadlines meaningless. The work will get done when the work gets done, freeing us from the scarcity effect. Additionally, having the constant trickle of rewards of seeing features go out the door should improve our engineers' self-control and increase their levels of intrinsic motivation, helping them resist technical debt. So we're not constrained by steam engines anymore. But we are constrained by processes that were made for a different era, were made for a different world, a world of certainty, where we wanted to do things cheaply rather than quickly. And now we know that these things aren't fit for purpose. There are better ways of doing things. When I started Engineer Better uh, with my co-founder, also called Dan, just to make things confusing, um, we spent some time trying to identify what beliefs we had in common. And one of the observations was that businesses are really only made out of two things, uh, the hard-end money of shareholders and the easily spent time of employees. For easily spent, you can read easily wasted. Now, it's easy to be glib about the hard-earned money of shareholders when we live in a time that's increasingly unequal and seems to be getting ever worse on that front. But Sam Ramji, who uh, was at Google Cloud, now at Autodesk, pointed out to me a few years ago that time isn't measured in seconds. Time is measured in heartbeats. You are all spending heartbeats listening to me talk. And you know what? I really hope that you're not going to ask for a refund because this is a non-refundable currency. You're not getting those heartbeats back. But we also know that time is equal to money. Therefore, money is equal to heartbeats as well. It doesn't make a difference whether you're wasting people's time with ridiculous processes that you know are slow and inefficient, stuck behind change control ticket queues, people twiddling their thumbs whilst they're waiting for a ticket to get bounced because they haven't filled in the form right, or whether you're wasting your employer's money, the company's money, on a process that you know isn't fit for purpose. You are wasting someone's time on the planet. That money came from somebody leaving their home in the morning, leaving their family at home, going out, earning a wage, saving the money up to give to their kids, to invest in a pension, to buy the stocks and shares for the enterprises that we know are doing daft things following outdated practices. And I don't know about you, but I can't get up in the morning knowing that I'm contributing to that. There are better ways of doing things. Anne-Marie Neatham, who's the COO of Technology at Ocado, I saw her give a talk recently at an organizational transformation conference, and she put it quite pithily, stop doing what you know to be wrong. If you're interested in any of the uh, research that I've cited, there is an exceptionally dry blog post up at engineerbetter.com slash brain, um, but it's all out there um, with a lot of stuff uh, to do with intrinsic motivation as well as the things I've talked about today. Um, there's a 20-minute version on YouTube called Anthropic Sympathy. Talk used to have a much sillier title that no one understood. And um, I wrote an excellent bit of clickbait on LinkedIn called Scrum Makes You Dumb, which uh, just talks about the scarcity effect. 
Um, it's doing quite well. I've got about 250 comments from people with Scrum in their job title. So if you want to troll your, troll your favorite Scrum master, then uh, you can Google that and send them a link. Um, but that's it from me. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Go and have an awesome conference. Make sure that you make sure everyone feel welcome here. Thank you.